David Wessel, and uh, I'm on the music faculty at UC Berkeley, and I'm, uh, I direct a center called the Center for New Music and Audio Technologies that uh, develops these kinds of things, develops software, works on a lot of work on user interfaces for music controllers and so on. This is just one of many kinds of things that we've developed. We're interested in languages for, for synthesis and musical processes, and I'm using one that I was involved in the development of early on in the mid-80s called Max MSP, and uh, uh, that's what I'm using here. It's a graphical programming language. And then just to fill out the chain, we've got to somehow get the sound into the rooms, and so we're interested in the loudspeaker, and uh, in fact, multi-channel loudspeakers that have lots of the ability to control the radiation pattern and so on. That's what that's what's going on in the, in the poster. Okay, so this this instrument is sort of a one along the way of what what I would call multi-touch interfaces. I wanted to go to music school, but my folks said no. So I went into sciences and did math and got my PhD in psychology, but I started studying perception of music, and I got very interested in computer music back in, already in 1963. And I uh, started thinking about what it'd be like to have instruments that would, I could play that used computer technology. I, I knew that I could get these track pads that were pressure sensitive. And when I saw them, I said, gee, wouldn't it be nice to make an array of them? So uh, I bought about 100 of them from, from a company called Interlink. And uh, in this case, this is, a, I think, about the third prototype. We laid out 32 of them. And each one is independent of the other. And each senses X, Y, and pressure. And, uh, what, what was important is that we don't think about these things as triggers, our thing, but rather as signal sources. So my gestures are, you know, analyzed as if they're continuous functions of time. And we wanted to send them out in a way that would allow these gestures to be locked tightly to the sound, not treated as things that would start and stop things, but control the sound all the way through. So we decided to send the signals as if they were audio data over to the thing. And I'm bringing in 96 channels of audio here to, the, uh, to this environment. And here, I've just a, this is just a kind of demonstration. I have the x-axis mapped to the frequency of one oscillator and the y-axis to another oscillator. And so I get a lot of what I would call control intimacy. Now this isn't so interesting to me as a musician, but it might be more interesting to demonstrate uh, a kind of orchestra of polyrhythmic drummers that I've built here by remapping, mapping the, the uh, things to different, in a different manner. So I've, I've mapped the axis, x-axis here to the speed of one drum loop and the y-axis to the speed of that same loop but played in stereo with it. So I get a kind of polyrhythmic thing right away, depending on where I touch. And I can control these speed and make these kind of things that I can... And then, you know, So this particular patch, or mapping between my gestures, and so, kind of invites me to explore this large territory of all these different polyrhythms. So I can, I can spend a lot of time just finding interesting regions and places to be. You know, there's a kind of laptop movement in music. There are a lot of people going into clubs and sitting behind their screens and mousing around. And it looks like they're doing office work or you're not sure what they're doing. They could be reading their email instead of <laughs> just playing out files. So how do you communicate something about your gestures and so on to an audience so that something like intentionality can be perceived? 
And I think the most important thing to communicate to an audience is force or effort. And if you, I, because most instruments, you know, you don't have to see the keys to see that the pianist is playing more forcefully or that the saxophonist is blowing harder. What you notice is that there's more effort being involved. So I think if we can communicate effort to the audience, we're going to make for a greater appreciation of what electronic instruments can be. Uh, of course, these ideas are, are being used by many pop musicians, Bjork being one of them. She started her show the other few weeks back with something called the Reactable, which is a, a multi-touch uh, surface interface that was developed in Barcelona. It's really funny, in 1975, uh, I got a call one day from Stevie Wonder saying, I want to find out about computers. And so he flew me out to New York and I took him to Bell Labs to meet up with Max Matthews. And, and of course, to this, today, he's, he, he and Ray Kurzweil got together because he was building a reading machine and I think that was the beginning of the Kurzweil instruments that came out. And so, so there, I think, I think computation is spread throughout the music industry dramatically everywhere. It's hidden. Uh, it certainly plays a big role in recording today. And I think when, with multi-touch and uh, instruments, uh, sensors that can, I like to think of the instrument as something I'm going to caress. You know, we, we have a, a great deal of capacity for fine control, and we need to, we need to get that and use it not only for musical applications, I think the gamers will love it. I think it's, it's going to have, look what happened when the iPhone just, when you just could squeeze the image and, and move it about. Right away it, it changed the way people thought about manipulating data. This uses a, a resistive technology, force sensing resistor. These pads are made by Interlink, and they make a lot of for, uh, force sensing resistor type devices. Uh, this, these pads were originally used in the Vaio computer. They're called VersaPads. And uh, then they were used for other applications like recognizing gestures in security systems and so on, I understand. When I saw that they were available, I said, Maybe I could build something with them. And then we, underneath here, are, we've got uh, some analog circuitry and A to D converters that condition the, the data ahead of time because we wanted to scan them at a higher rate than they were being, than the circuits that Inter Interlink was suggesting. So these data are then sent over here to this field programmable gate array where, as integers and 12 bits and so on per dimension. And in this field program of gate array, we actually um, <clears throat> get them all formatted and so on to go as packets over Ethernet to our audio driver. But we want to, we kind of want to keep our host processor unloaded, so we, we do some data, some conditioning in here, and we do as well um, integer to float conversion. So these are sent over as 32 bit floats over to the uh, uh, host processor. And we've also got the ability to send audio back over to these light pipe interfaces where I, if I had my, in other words, I've got eight channels of audio in and eight channels of audio out here. So I can put an external uh, DAC and ADC system on this. And here I've got plugs for foot pedals. And if I wanted to hook up a MIDI device, I've got MIDI in only. I could, I could plug it and then it gets multiplexed into the data stream. And we're very concerned about low jitter, tightly time tagged uh, data. So we time tag everything, and we're we're um, we're able to get very very ac well, essentially, effectively no jitter or down in the picoseconds.